welcome everybody to another episode of A Worthy Conversation, um, our local and homemade uh, Silverline series. Now, this series is essentially a conversation, a series of conversations that aims to be worthy. Um, I'm your host for today's conversation and my co-host is Joaquin Zaidan. You'll find in the uh, chat box the actual uh, rules of engagement. So if you could just adhere to it as we proceed. And so without any further ado, I will begin to walk you through our logic for today's conversation. Um, today's series aims to continue our discussion on impact and in an effort to understand and track and make more sense of what the word impact really means when it comes to the culture and creative industries. With that in mind, we ask the question, if a story is told and no one is around to hear it, then did it even happen? So with that common belief in the strength of cultural and creative expression as a means to really instigate and um, begin a sense of impact, um, particularly from a social perspective, we begin especially this year's Worthy Conversation series. Uh, this year, we hope, inshallah, that it stands to give us um, a better sense of expectations and a better sense of um, optimism, considering the way 2020 has been. Um, and with work on politics and art being based on the assumption that art plays a formative role in the constitution of social life and in the ways that people take responsibility for creating their own histories, stories, and in participating in the management of their own social and political realities. Today, we discuss the nuances of making and producing and working with artistic expression in historically complex and challenging environments with particular focus on Yemen and Sudan. Hailing from Yemen, we have uh, Mohamed Bawazir, who is a sociocultural or activist worker uh, in the Yemeni cultural sector. For the past eight years, he co-founded two youth-led initiatives to support the arts and artists in his hometown, Mukhalla. He's currently leading memes, who, which he will tell us a little bit more about in this conversation, a social organization that aims to create an artistic ecosystem and create and have a creative economy in Yemen. And as well, we have Khalid al-Bay. Khalid al-Bay is a Romanian-born, Qatar-raised, Sudanese, award-winning artist, political cartoonist, and cultural producer and consultant based between Doha and Copenhagen. Um, Khalid is on the board of several global arts and media initiatives and here with us he will discuss a little bit more about his work so thank you guys for taking the time to join us today and um i'd like to just start us off with just asking you to just introduce yourselves to us just give us an idea of who you are um can i start with you muhammad first and then we'll give the floor on to you khalid sure thanks azza uh, first of all, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity and this worthy uh, conversation that we'll have together. Um, my name is Muhammad Bawazir. I come from a small town in southern Yemen called Mukalla, uh, which you see right here behind me. I'm trying to promote kind of the, the history and buildings of it uh, through my Zoom calls. Um, born and raised there uh, for the first 18 years of my life. Um, Afterwards, I moved to Saudi Arabia to pursue my bachelor's in management, and I'm currently working in management consulting. During the past eight years, I've uh, founded two youth-led initiatives uh, working around arts and social engagement, um, both of which have shared the same kind of goals and, um, and ways of uh, creating social change. Uh, and I'm currently leading uh, to an extent leading them from abroad, leading one from abroad uh, um, through WhatsApp and Slack, <laughs> basically, and uh, trying to um, push a new generation of young, uh, young people to work in the cultural and creative sector um, and try to be more um, socially engaged, basically through arts. Exciting, Khaled, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are? I think you're on mute, Khaled. Yeah. I tried so hard not to be on mute when I first started. <laughs> like, I, just, I was like, I'm not gonna do this again. And it's the first thing I do. Uh, this is the word of the year, you're on mute. Um, my name is Khaled. Uh, Sudani, um, I 
started doing political cartoons around 2008 um, online because I didn't have kind of access to, to newspapers and so on. And maybe I didn't really believe in, in, in how um, uh, freely I can, I can, I can work uh, as, a, as a cartoonist. So I just turned into social media and now I, I'm basically based off social media. Uh, from there, um, or at the same time, I was working in, uh, in um, museums. Uh, my last job was I was the head of public art for the Qatar Museums. Uh, but in this last 10 years, I've done um, a lot of uh, things that take from uh, cartooning into uh, different projects uh, around art, culture, and socially engaged art. Well, I'm glad you mentioned social engagement. I think now is a good time for us to kind of have an idea a little bit more from both of you. What exactly are you working um, in terms of social participation and social engagement through creative um, expression? So if you could give us a little bit of an idea of what it is that you're doing when it comes to social participation uh, through creative expression. Mifina. <laughs> Um, okay, so basically, um, currently I'm, I'm leading uh, memes. Should I introduce memes right now? Um, well, memes is basically um, an organization that stems from uh, a social and community need. Uh, um, let me give you a bit of context, uh, just taking a step back. So I come from this uh, portion of Yemen called Hadramaut, which is a region filled with culture and arts and uh, rich with a tradition that have been uh, um, such a, um, an overwhelming cultural um, uh, trade that is associated with Hadramaut. However, for the past 25 uh, to 30 years, that uh, presence, cultural presence have uh, faded away. Um, the community back in Hadramaut really feels a need to revive that uh, um, kind of movement and, and, uh, and atmosphere, uh, especially young people. Young people nowadays, they feel that they have a great sense and a great, cap great capabilities to excel in cultural and creative industries on global levels. Now, we've searched and, and, and um, met with lots of young people, artists and not, uh, and, and kind of surveyed how they feel about the current situation in Hadramaut, how that, that uh, all of that uh, kind of arts presence have disappeared and what do they need to bring it up, bring it, bring it back. So we came uh, with this idea of creating an ecosystem. Now, arts is not just one thing. We don't train uh, people and next day we have a kind of an arts and uh, artistic environment. We need to create an ecosystem. From there, we established memes, which is a combination of three meme, letter meme in Arabic, which stands for Mu'assasa, uh, Ma'ahad, Umakan. So Mu'assasa is an organization to lead a social and cultural movement uh, to promote the aesthetics of art, to uh, introduce and raise awareness of various arts and art artists to basically enrich the culture uh, uh, around arts. This would push people into exploring arts and basically trying to pursue uh, um, building their capabilities and forms in whether in their various forms of art. There comes Ma'had, which is an institution, an artistic uh, establishment to build the capabilities in the arts itself, themselves. Um, from there, the artists need to basically dismiss and display and exhibit the arts and have a place to actually uh, put them to consumption. There's, uh, there comes ma, uh, there there's comes Masaha, which is the, le the, the last meme where they can actually uh, introduce these arts into the community. The arts could uh, be exhibited for social change, to engage more people, to engage a community, 
um, to uh, basically to sell the arts themselves as well, to promote more of a creative uh, economy uh, around, uh, around the arts. Now that creates a, what we assume is a, uh, uh, and hope it will create a virtuous circle that will basically uh, get developed and grow bigger with time, uh, where people, once they see that this cycle is moving, then they will kind of have a snowball effect of uh, joining this whole ecosystem from the start to finish. Um, what we are trying to establish is not just um, kind of these three entities, physical entities. What we're trying to establish is actually these the notions of, of uh, that comes behind them is how we push people to actually um, pursue uh, knowing uh, knowledge about arts and aesthetics and uh, how they can uh, kind of introduce more arts to their own communities anywhere in Yemen. Uh, what we need to push, what we're pushing for is how people can actually um, uh, either self-study or uh, themselves give uh, give back to their communities of their own artistic uh, um, knowledge uh, in, in, in the type of ma'ahad where they have a, a kind of a cultural and artistic exchange. Uh, and uh, basically also how to consume art more frequently, how to actually uh, pay the right price for art, which is a very important notion that people are not uh, appreciative of art that really very uh, um, uh, don't don't give it the right prices. Thus, doesn't really uh, induce the artists to uh, produce more and express more. So that's kind of what we're trying to do: is changing a mentality rather than just kind of establishing physical um, entities. Wow. That's quite a mission. And I think we're going to go a little bit more into the challenges that that presents itself to be. But I'd like to sort of dig Shweya with Khalid um, on your work when it comes to social participation and social engagement. Um, I think at this point, it's a very good opportunity to introduce Sudan Retold because it's a, it's a fresh work that essentially um, highlights um, different artistic interpretations of um, the artist's relationship with history, but I don't want to speak on it a lot more or better than you, so please tell me a little or tell us a lot more about this. Um, Sudan, Sudan Retold is uh, a project that I, I, I really wanted to do for, for, um, for a very long time. It is uh, a book um, about, it's an art book about the history of Sudan. Uh, me being a cartoonist um, and, and avid like graphic novels and comic book reader, I, I, I see cartoons as something that is uh, very easy to deliver a lot of information. So having a graphic novel about something that's very dear to me, which is uh, my country, Sudan, which is sadly a lot of people don't know anything about including Sudanese people, right? So because of the narrative, because of, you know, in, in Sudan itself, because of the international narrative around Sudan and the national narrative, even in the Arab world, yeah, I mean, my, my, there's, not, there's not a lot of things that people know about Sudan, except for that, you know, they're, they're black, basically. That's it. Like, you know, they speak Arabic occasionally and they're black. So that's it. And me growing up in the Gulf, basically we have to all, yeah, I mean, endure all, all sort of, you know, kids being racist, of course, like, you know, but that's, that's how it was. But it's, it's like, you have to explain to them, well, you know, you, know, you have a tiger in your, you know, you, you go around in elephants and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, even though Sudan has a lot of like very positive things that we grew up always hearing from our parents, uh, you know, having the first woman judge, having the first, uh, you know, uh, color TV actually in the region, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the Khartoum universities from 1902, you know, a lot of a lot of incredible things. So, but nobody knows these things. And and because of the economical situation in Sudan and the lack of storytelling in Sudan, nobody really knows, you know, and nobody really cares. You don't see the importance of it, of, of, of how do we market ourselves? How do we tell people who we are, you know? So, um, and of course, you know, being the neighbor of, of, of Egypt, of course, the mother of the media in, 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 
the Arab world, and you know the the how um, the the stereotypical look at a Sudanese person or a dark person in the media and, and so on. So it came from inside me. It came from a lot of uh, a lot of hurt. So I wanted to really tell stories of Sudan by Sudanese people in a very creative way. So because of the lack of storytelling, because of the lack of art coming out of Sudan and so on. So uh, what I did was I worked with uh, a Goethe Institute in Sudan. We put together uh, a, a workshop. We made a call out for any creative in Sudan. The idea at the beginning was I want to make a graphic novel about the history of Sudan. And then I went, okay, that's, that's part of the issue because I come from a certain uh, um, uh, family in Sudan. I come from a certain background in Sudan. So that's going to be my point of view on Sudan. And that's the opposite of what I want to do. So why don't I make it uh, a lot of artists do, uh, graphic artists do stuff about Sudan. And then I was like, okay, why keep it to graphic artists? Let's open it up. Let's, see, let's say creatives do work that, that reflects stories about Sudan. And this is what happened. We made the call out. A lot of people applied. It was amazing. Um, of course, like half the people <laughs> that got accepted showed up uh, because you know that is how it is. And, and at the beginning, uh, it was it was tough to to make them understand the ideas because most of them were 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 young and coming up at the time to reflect uh, their versions of their own history. Like, don't look at the usual things that Sudanese people look at. You know, don't look at uh, uh, the Mahdiya. Don't look at the pyramids. Don't look at just look, you can, but let's go deeper than that. Let's go into your own history. Let's go into your you know stories that your grandmother told you. Let's go into urban legends, let's, you know, uh, political things that happened. So it was basically a look back into these artists' uh, um, um, uh, memories of Sudan or the futures of Sudan, really. And, and that was it. When we came up with like 31 amazing, incredible pieces of art that are put together in, a, in, a, in this amazing, amazingly designed uh, uh, book. I said amazing a lot, but it's really amazing. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. It's called Sudan Retold. And uh, sadly, we were dealing with a German uh, publisher that, that, that only sells in German Amazon because they're German. And, uh, but it's, it's a, it's, if you have a chance to get it, it's, a, it's an incredible book that tells a lot. You don't have to be interested in Sudan. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful coffee, coffee table book. That's amazing. So Anna, I want to bring um, the audience's attention to the fact that you're both not based in the countries that you're actually working towards or working with or collaborating with, Yanni. Um, I say you're working towards it because it's very obvious that you have a vision of what you believe and what you perceive. Um, the, the social engagement when it comes to creative expression and or political and social reform through the, the vehicle of art and creative expression. So, um, with that consideration, there's got to be a, a sense of obvious challenges that are you know, pretty easy to spot, but I'd like you guys to just give us a bit of an idea of the unique challenges that you, you face because of the unique situation that you're in. It could be because of the different mediums or the different artists that you're working with, all the way to making this vision and this reality come through because of logistics. So, and I want to start off with you, um, Hamad, and then I'll jump with you, Khaled Chwaya, into the working with different creative expressions and how you can sort of, um, how you've managed that, because I find that pretty interesting. So, Mohammed, can you just walk us a little bit through the, I think the logistics has got to be the biggest challenge when it comes to Yemen, um, given the, the obvious circumstances. Exactly, yep. So um, basically, <clears throat> Yemen is a very unique situation, I think, yeah, even compared to Sudan. Um, so we're, we, we are at the bottom of the food chain and everything in all of type, types of services. So basically even the team in Yemen cannot communicate with, the, with each other at times. Uh, so that's how, re, how bad it is. Um, at times you cannot get a hold of a, a, a person on the phone for hours and hours on, onwards. Um, one person just got their, their internet connection stolen like a week ago for the whole week and he's not he's literally like one day he found out he's not without internet and someone else got it so it's like that's crazy so yeah that's it yeah it's gone but he got it back yesterday <laughs> so 
so yeah, it's 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 that crazy, right? Um, but basically, the main challenges I face communicating with the team or like in general, um, basic um, internet issues, electricity issues. Um, you didn't find electricity for hours, um, um, and and then the occasional crises <laughs> that come by of there's no gas, there's no um, whatever, right? And so that th those circumstances really tap into the emotions of of the people who, uh, who are working with us, um, um, pressure from, from all over the place, from their families. I experienced that a lot once I, when, when, I, when I was there at times. Uh, I, I literally slept on the street for two weeks uh, because electricity is cut, cut off like for 20 hours a day. And there's no, it's like in the middle of the summer Right, and this, it's like you cannot work in such circumstances. You cannot even think in such circumstances. So you you can just imagine how bad uh, things could be. Um, so that's kind of in in general, it's an it's an emotional uh, uh, pressure uh, uh, that hinders people from actually performing and and just living basically. Um, however, we, we always try to uh, overcome these circumstances. So um, um, we definitely not we're not pushing people to the to the edge. <laughs> um, basically, at, at every time we can get, we give yeah, everyone uh, kind of a I don't know a month break or two, whatever like that, just to for a first chance of, for them to recover, to reflect, to uh, pay attention to their to their. Uh, families their needs uh, whatever they want so they can uh, basically rejoice and come back to us I, I that's that brings me to my to kind of our operating model we're a volunt strictly voluntary based organization uh, we do not give out salaries we do not give out any uh, co compensation whatsoever for three years um, this allowed us to to work in a different type of um, operating model that's, that actually keeps us going, uh, but also is not very restrictive. So we, we can actually give a good portion of our people a break while others take on their job and we, we, we kind of uh, keep things going. Um, this have worked well with us for the past two years, and that allowed lots of us to be very flexible, very uh, um, comfortable with working while not losing touch. You're not a, an organization that kind of breaks the tie between you and and, and uh, the volunteers. They're, they're always part of the family. They can join back to the team as quickly as clicking a, with the WhatsApp group link and go, getting back to the group, and that's it. They're part of the team again. Hey, what's the mission? What's the what's uh, what are the tasks we have? And then they're they're up and running. Uh, that's kind of how we work, and uh, that's how we, we we kept going for the past couple of years. Exciting, certified, one hundred percent fueled by passion, by the sounds of it. And yeah. because with all of these challenges, the only thing that honestly could keep you going, given the circumstances, has to be passion. Um, exactly. Khaled, I want to kind of discuss with you a little bit about how that transition when it came to Sudan Retold, shifting it from a, a strictly graphic novel um, or an iteration of um, graphic interpretations of history towards something more open in, in terms of creative expression. What type of, um, how did that open open you up to a, a, a different way of working and a different way of engaging with creatives, um, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, obviously I'm used to working with, with, um, with different mediums because of working in the museum and working in, uh, in different art organizations that, you know, uh, we, I, I've seen how other people work. I'm not just, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the graphics or in the, uh, in the cartooning. Um, uh, field, so I know how much of a treasure this could be if it's if it's different mediums, you know. Because if I if I do it as strictly a graphic novel or a strictly a cartoonist thing, then I'm targeting a very niche of people, right? It's going to be nice, but 
you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to be as widespread as I can. But when I open it up to other, other creatives, I'm doing two things. Uh, one, the buyers of the book or the, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be more. And then I'm going to, and the, the most important thing for me is I'm going to expose more artists to the world. Right. So I'm not going to say just, oh, just cartoonists are, are, are here. No, everyone is here. And you can see the diversity, the kind of work, you know. So th this, this was the most important thing to me is just to show the diversity, not only in the history of Sudan, which in, which in Sudan Retold also was incredible. Just, you know, how, uh, you know, ev 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 everyone is, is, is um, talking about different ethnicities and different stories and all of that, but also the diversity of the, the mediums that are available in young Sudanese people who mostly sometimes didn't even go to art school. It's, it's an amazing exploration of how um, a person's imagination presents itself. If you really just allow it to be, that's yeah. how far it can actually go. So I, I want to sort of discuss with you guys a bit more the, um, beyond the notions of the challenges and, and um, we understand that the challenges are there. I think by now you figured out that this is what you signed up for. You've been doing it long enough to sort of see it coming. The challenge is coming, whether you like it or not, and you're here and you're, you're not going anywhere. So given the, the sense of the challenges or the craziness or how creative they can be as well, um, and at certain times, the, the sense of the low visibility of, of the work, not because of the lack of quality. Obviously, the, the level of qualities of the work that you do is um, beyond presentable. You're absolutely proud of it. You're proud to call it. Um, your own and that's why it's out there but it's it's more to do with the the low visibility that it makes on a general level um, and sometimes you're dealing with situations where you're pushing back on an extremely negative image um, when it comes to the communities that you're engaging with or the communities that you're trying to tell the stories of so in that sense and given all of the challenges and all of the the criticism that you sometimes hear at times from the actual community that you're serving that you're doing this work for why do you persist to to keep going why do you continue to try to present these narratives these stories that are um, at times the world has decided are better left untold but i, I want to just go into Yemen a little bit because if there is um, the opposite of don't judge a book by its cover everyone is just doing that to Yemen Yemen has been decided and the, the cover is there this is it we're here and this is what we're expecting and so here you are you're not only facing the the basic logistic challenges that you've described just getting internet and having people connected just to to share an idea once you've gone past that hurdle, you're trying to get this collective of people to just not only change their point of view, but hear you out. Why do you keep doing it? Why do you continue to keep doing it? Okay, sorry, uh, my camera just, uh, broke somehow, you know. Um, but basically, <laughs> I'll just uh, go with the, with the flow. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, um, you've already answered 10 minutes ago yourself, uh, passion, only passion. This is the only thing that drives us all. Um, it's, it's around 40 of us, by the way. <laughs> and it's that the, everything that drives us is passion, really. Like we all feel and dream of this uh, great vision of reviving the artistic environment around us. How, how we used to be, how things used to be, how we saw our parents um, 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 have studied and, and uh, worked in arts, how they've really um, expressed themselves in ways we have never experienced, right? My own, my, my, my late father himself had uh, done Shakespeare in middle school in the 60s. Now that you have in, in Yemen, in the middle of Yemen, in the middle of the desert in Yemen, right? In the 70s or 80s, there have been uh, um, roaming cinemas going around to the Bedouin areas of Hadramaut, right? To have movie nights in the middle of the desert. Uh, in, the seven, in the 80s, Mukalla and Aden uh, had uh, at least uh, 
Mukalla had five pipes or three cinemas, and Aden has at least had at least forty. Nowadays, in Mukalla itself, one cinema is a wedding hall, another is a basically a a, a goat uh, <laughs> a goat uh, barn, and the third is a, is a wreck. In thirty years' time. The only artistic uh, or arts uh, institute in Mukalla or in Hadramut, it, uh, which is a large region in eastern Yemen, the only artist, artist uh, institute has been closed permanently in, in 1994. Now, this is what we're aiming. This is what we're aiming to bring back, right? We are saddened and, and, and uh, uh, very saddened by the, these, the, the reality and these facts. And uh, passion is the only thing that drives us to towards bringing them back. Um, so stories have of success in the past eight years, which I personally and most of us have person personally experienced uh, of people in our age uh, uh, that that learned and created uh, success for themselves, have learned arts and uh, actually. Uh, went very far to um, establish themselves and to bring back to their communities is are things that also drives us forward. One very amazing story I, I, I feel is uh, a person I, I cherish and dearly love, uh, a friend of mine from 10 or 12 years. Uh, his name is Haytham Al-Hadrami. This young man is uh, um, is my age, basically, and he learned to play oud uh, on YouTube. He uh, went to uh, basic musicians in, uh, in his hometown and learned by apprenticeship from them for like, around a year or two. In, in two years' time, he became one of the best musicians in his, in his little town, and he started in, going to weddings and kind of playing in, in these weddings, etc. Now, at the end of the day, there's no kind of pathway for anyone in, in the art sector. And uh, unless he, he moves uh, in the same kind of, uh, in a plateau, right? He's not, he cannot go into an arts institute. He's not really aiming for something greater than uh, just playing in wedding, wedding concerts. Now, in one of our events, he had a chance to uh, play in front of an audience and he got discovered there. Someone took him to this businessman where the, he got a scholarship to study Oud in Egypt for four years. He played with Nasir Shamma. He went to Arabs Got Talent with his team. He 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 came a long way from 2013 until 2000. He he's still he's completing his studies right now. Now Haytham in 2013 just needed a chance to play in front of an audience to get discovered to get that opportunity. And during those years, he've studied a, a, a curricula of academics to actually uh, strengthen his knowledge of art. Now, Haytham now is coming back with us to train 30 people, the same things he missed when he was their age. He's training musicians that trained the same way he did, right? but never got the academic structure to, to actually read a music notation. Haytham really needed that at the time, and now he's coming back to the community to give that back. Haytham actually came back a year ago, a, uh, yes, a year ago, in 2019, and he, he came with the amazing determination to do a 10-day music uh, uh, course and a little kind of music concert. He came like he he didn't care of the logistics. He he totally volunteered to do that. He told me, he told me personally, I don't care of anything. I give me a, a group of people and I'll do a course even in the streets. And we actually did one in the streets for ten days, and then we kind of ramped up a kind of a what was it five hundred dollars to do this final concert. Right, but we he trained thirty people for ten days straight, and he didn't. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's been uh, dedicated throughout, and now we've got a good a good uh, funding for a good project, and we're doing a, a doing the same thing he wanted to do 
for a long time on a larger scale. So that's what keeps us going. That's what we do, how we do, and why we do what we do. That's really amazing and beyond inspiring, Saraha. Um, and Khalid, I just have one question for you, and then we'll open the floor to some really interesting questions. Min, uh, Min Ilian, she's got, she's on fire. Um, Khalid, then I just want to ask you, why do you think that art is the right way, or at least a way, a more effective way to instill social change? Wouldn't it be more effective to just um, directly get involved with politics? and just try to operate as a politician to instill a bit of a social impact? For me personally? Yes, indeed. I think that, um, I mean, you know, it's a lot of people asking that question. I mean, you know, you're, you're always criticizing, you know? Um, but the thing is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, some more, some people are made for something, you know, and some people just want to be politicians. Some people just want to be artists. I don't think I'm good at the management part, especially in terms of a country. You know, uh, I think what I'm what I'm good at is this pointing out that this needs to be fixed. And this is, I think this is really interesting for me because I studied interior designing, right? I studied interior designing, interior architecture, furniture design, and stuff. So that kind of gave me the 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 in way into critiquing so when i walk into a, a space i say okay this this can move over here this door can be over there the window could be here because the sunlight is better so i'm 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 not ready to build that space I, that's why most of my projects i don't do them alone because i can't handle doing it alone you know the book is not alone i do it with 31 people uh, uh the other projects I'm, I'm building a library i'm building i'm doing this thing called the so that art is fun all of these projects are about community right so this is this is what i do best i work with other people i try to you know get people's connected i think i'm good at that as well because you know my social network because of the many people i know but um but i believe in the power of art as a, a changer and as a, as a, as like because you know as a cartoonist for example a phd holder can write a paper on a cartoon and you can have a conversation with an eight-year-old on a cartoon you know and it takes an eight-year-old to draw a cartoon like it doesn't <laughs> you don't need to be anything so that's that's basically what it is you know um it, it's 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 about um knowing like this is this is what i'm good at this is what i think i could do and this is what i'm going to go for you know, so and I believe in the power of art because of that, because like even in the Arab Spring, like the first thing that exploded literally was art, you know, yeah, a month into uh, the, the, the Arab Spring, you see street art everywhere. This doesn't th that didn't exist before that, you know, and all these all these guys now calling themselves street artists that never they never were street artists before because you can never do that. But the first thing is that they wrote on walls. It wasn't, they went from Facebook walls to proper walls. Right. This is this is this is how you talk to people. Right. This is how people see it. And, you know, the graffiti being on the street, even in the Sudanese revolution. Now, like before six months, seven months before the Sudanese revolution, you're driving around Khartoum and you see all kind of slogans in the street. Right. So it went from like slogans that are went really fast. People are writing and running. Right. Mostly girls, by the way, to. Proper artwork, you know. People sat down and did like proper murals and everything. And this is when you know that the fear is broken. Nobody's scared to come down and like being being chased and all of that. So it's this is I think this is what I'm good at and this is what I'm I, I intend to do. Exciting. Just to keep on instigating and keep on triggering everybody until they actually Hopefully. get up and make some change. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> or kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever <laughs> happens first, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just said. Um, so at this point, I think it's um, safe for us to begin taking on the questions that we have in the chat box. Um, Elian has a very interesting question. Based on the Yemeni experience, I'm Muhammad, this is, I believe, for you. Based on the Yemeni experience, is creativity a luxury when a lot of people are looking for their basic rights, like electricity and gas? How do you think creativity or artistic expression can help? 
the community in the midst of all of that. Um, okay. Um, so basically, what we believe in is culture is a basic need. Now, it's very important to realize how, how arts and a creative expression and social engagement through art can really levitate lots of these um, um, challenges, emotions um, that, that people experience. Now, I'm not talking about people in uh, kind of on the front lines where they actually literally very every day are affected by, by bombings. Now I'm talking about people in relatively stable situations where they can actually um, benefit from the existence of arts and creative expression and benefit from their own, uh, um, from the ability of expressing themselves uh, through art. Uh, there's been a recent research uh, by the Center of, uh, um, it's, it's, called, it's called Cape uh, Capio. Um, basically, it's aiming and, and recommending to support art and artistic uh, uh, environments and spaces, cultural spaces to promote more um, artistic expression in the realm of uh, peacemaking and, and, and dialogue and um, expression, basically. These um, notions are very important in, in the middle of this situation, particularly. It's not, it's not a luxury, it's a, a crucial way of recovery. It's a, it's a necessity, actually. I think, Yanni, just stating it as a basic need that, خلاص. <laughs> We're done here. Um, so I'm just going to ask another question from Ilian. Yani, your Asila Liom, Ilian, on fire. Um, she states, Muhammad, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation about educating people on how to consume art and pay for the right price. So Sudan retold as a final product was a coffee table, um, a, a coffee table book. So do you think we are seeing art these days with capitalistic eyes? I think this question is um, more, Madri, if Khaled, you could advise us a bit more on this. Or Muhammad, Bardo, it's interesting to see from your perspective, from the Yemeni context, how that relationship um, is sort of manifesting itself. Because yani, you mentioned it in the beginning, and it was one of the challenges to try and educate the general public on how much they should invest when it comes to art and, and how to sort of begin that journey. So, Mohammed, would you like to walk us a little bit through that? Wallahi, yani, Khaled, are, Khaled, are you? <laughs> Let's start with Khaled. Yeah. Let's go with Khaled. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, I think it's, it's um, to create um, an economy that respects art um, as part of it, uh, we need to have people that respect art. So if we don't have collectors, you don't have that economy, basically. If you don't have people that appreciate this kind of thing and think of it as something that's, this is an investment, sadly, as capitalist that it sounds, but that's, that's what we need to do. They think of this as an investment and we, need, we appreciate it. Yes, that's the first thing. Second thing, this could be good for the future that then you create uh, um, a creative economy out of it. Um, this is very important. It needs institutions. It needs a lot of institutions. So we don't uh, get trapped into the Western idea of doing it because now basically what you need to do is, you know, you have to appear to the Western collector. You have to appear to the Western organizations for you to become that artist, right? Oh, like, you, you know, you buy his painting and they're in Sotheby's and Christie's and, and, and Phillips and so on. And then you're, you're then, you know, the, the um, museums will acquire your works and all of that. You have to, you have to go through that very, um, very westernized kind of thing. And, and if you do any sort of other work 
uh, then you, you're, you're not an artist, you're like a craftsman and that's a whole thing. And then you, they come to Africa and expect you to do African things and they go to Asia and expect you to do Asian things. So if we, if we don't kind of create our own economy, this is not, this is not gonna work. And uh, we're, not, we're, we're never gonna have uh, a creative uh, um, uh, economy. And we're just gonna be basically running behind a, um, you know, rich Europeans or Americans, you know, to, 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 to have the stamp. And, and sadly, this is how it is until today. Um, movement started to happen in the Gulf a little bit, uh, you know, with Dubai, Dubai, you know, very capitalistic, of course, you know, with the whole uh, our Dubai thing and then institutions in Doha, like, the, you know, the, the, the rest of the museums and all of that. Um, there, there, there was things happening, but of course, you know, politics always gets in the middle of, of all of these things. And of course, in Kuwait and all of that. Uh, but I think it's very important for me, what I, you know, most of my work, I suck at this. That's why I'm, I'm a broke cartoonist, but it's, it's, it's most of my work is, is free online. It's under creative commons license for you to share and to use and everything. And the whole book, Sudan, Sudan, uh, Sudan Retold is available online as well. So it's it's a you know it's a website. It has a lot. Most most of the most of the works are there and they're available as well. So I believe in open source. I believe in having art to be available for everyone and not for it to be an elitist thing. So because when I have this as a coffee table book, you know how how many people in Sudan are going to be afford to buy it? But it's not made for that. It's not made for Sudanese people to afford to buy it. So these people can you know. We can we can we can discuss this with other issues, right? But this is basically to elevate the artist, to elevate uh, uh, um, um, the, the 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 cultural economy even in Sudan. So these artists themselves can make money and come and produce other things that the people can in Sudan can can enjoy. But sadly, right now, as I said, we have to adore to 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 Western standards of of what is art, how how much, and what is this art worth, and all of that. Wow, <laughs> we entered into the realm of uh, imperialism and the impact of the West on how we perceive and, and how we consume art very, very smoothly. My favorite yeah. subject matter, <laughs> as you always try to liberate and democratize art, you always try to push from the South. Um, wow, I think we have, Yani, we have three more questions, but I don't know if we have the time to take them on board, Joachim. What, uh, we have what seven minutes, so if we can have brief answers to the questions, I think we can okay. aim to take them. Tamam, um, that would be great. So I'm just going to... A, they're pretty pretty heavy. I don't know how we're going to like bullet point sure. that. Um, yani, from Ali, we have, can art resolve conflicts? And... No. <laughs> Thank you, Khaled. <laughs> <That was great. laughs> when, we, when we said brief, Khaled, not that brief. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed, do you have any other thoughts, or any, any counter thoughts? And Hassan Khaled has said all he has to say about it. It's like, nope, that's it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it depends on how, the big, uh, how big of a conflict this is. Um, but... Uh, Art is more of a, a method, um, among others, to, to discuss around conflicts, not to actually solve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have another question from Ilian. So, and I guess Khaled kind of answered it um, as he was uh, yeah. discussing it earlier. Um, yeah, yeah, so I've received a question from Omar to you, Muhammad. Could you tell us a story about one of the best projects that you've done and what impact did it have on the society? Okay, then uh, let me tell you about our recent, most recent project. Um, we actually haven't got the chance to see the full impact. I cannot talk numbers, but uh, we're very hopeful of that and we're very proud. Uh, so this is one of the first of its kind kind of uh, project where we teach uh, young, um, not very young, basically artisans who are working in traditional crafts in wood, uh, uh, palm fronds, and in uh, embroidery to modernize their products to appeal to the more, more modern consumption. Now, this was a, a, a research-based 
project where a friend of mine, Yasser Gnawi, he's a visual artist who made a, this book from uh, research he's done for eight years, uh, going around regions of Hadramaut and discovering that um, our arts and crafts are actually being uh, dis are disappearing, uh, especially in the motives and, and traditional products. So uh, we've, uh, we've came to the idea that this, this disappearance has come because the uses of these products are, are not there anymore. And then thus the modern consumption consumer in Yemen are, is not appealed by the, the, the products they produce. So we're modernizing these products and the, the artisans have come up with a various a variety of new products that are um, for modern uses. Like you, you, we found we have um, in candle holders, whatever, uh, clocks, etc., made out of wood and traditional um, uh, motives. So we're very hopeful of how this will take us. I have, I think, one last question for both of you. So since um, you both live outside your countries and you're telling the stories of your own countries, did you ever face some sort of uh, resistance from the locals accusing you like, you know, you're living in your own, there's a better luxury in life that you're actually living in. So, so what gives you the right to tell the story of a local? Have you ever faced that kind of uh, resistance of, um, you know, what gives you the right to tell my story where you're not living in the country itself? Uh, Hamad, if you'd like to start. Um, for me, no, I don't believe in, in that sense, no. But I've actually lived in Yemen for a, a, a good period of my life and I'm very attached to it and I always go, to, go back. So that kind of, kind of um, gives me, gets me out of that classification maybe. Okay. But I, I work on, on Yemen on a constant uh, basis. Thanks. Khaled, have you ever faced such kind of resistance? Um, yeah, with, with, with political cartoons, of course, I do. Uh, and it, 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 and a lot of times it made me step back and not really talk about uh, issues that are very local to Sudan, yani, things that are not the obvious, you know, one plus one equals two, Omar al-Bashir is a dictator, done, no. Like, it's just the, the nitty gritty of, of, of like, Azmat al-Raghif, or Azmat al -Sharif. Sometimes I don't talk about it because I don't know enough about it. So, and I think that's, 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 um, that's key and of course because my you know my work as a cartoonist i i i um i work on everything that interests me because i really don't work for anyone so i a lot of times yeah and I, I do a cartoon about whatever and they're like oh you know you're not from here how do you know da, 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 da. but i do make sure that i know what i'm talking about before i do that cartoon or i write that article or whatever i do uh in terms of cultural projects yes also in sudan definitely uh, because, it, you know, I'm like, so I, as I said, I'm working on uh, a public library and most of the, like the, 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 like when I tell someone I'm working on a public library and they're like bookshop, I'm like, no library, bookshop, nope, library, you know, so it's like, so how are you going to make money? I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to make money. It's not about money. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the idea of it, but because mostly I know and I understand because I live in both worlds that if you don't see something you don't know what it's worth, right? You don't know the importance of it. So if, you, if, you, if you've never seen a hospital, you don't know what a hospital is. Like how, why is this important? I've been living all my life without a hospital, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. So when you tell someone, well, we need an art museum. No, we don't. Yes, we do. You know, and it just, it keeps, it keeps going. So when it comes to building institutions or trying to build institutions, which was, was what I'm trying to do, uh, with a, a lot more uh, people involved, of course, is 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 that is that th these are these are the basic line for us to go anywhere. If we don't have this, we're not doing it. So I'm not I'm I'm not taking the bullshit basically. So I'm just I'm I'm going and doing that. But when it comes to political issues, when it comes to uh, things I don't know a lot about, I don't I don't I try much not to talk about it because, as you said, I'm not there. Um, so I, I'm not gonna talk about it in that sense. Thank you. I guess time's up, Asif. Well, yeah, I think this uh, wraps us up really, really nicely. Thank you 
to everyone that has joined us and I'd like to thank you especially Muhammad and Khalid for your time and for your um, candid and honest uh, answers and um, we look forward to having you guys again in another edition of A Worthy Conversation. And, uh, thank have you so much thank you for having us. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.